We're so happy to have you here in our classroom space. This is our classroom space. We have two uh, smaller auxiliary classrooms that we also use as a play space and then a smaller classroom for small group work. But this is the, the classroom in which Maurice and Elizabeth teach every day in our morning class and our afternoon class. Just to share our plan for today, we have a presentation to share with you about some of the philosophical foundations that support and guide our work here at Hollingworth with our children and with our teachers. And then at the end, we've left time for questions and answers and also time for you to review the room having uh, viewed our presentation. Hollingworth, Pre Hollingworth Preschool is one program within the Hollingworth Center. And within the center, our mission is dual. Uh, we're here to serve our children, uh, the children of our preschool children, as well as our educators, our teachers, who are all teachers, college uh, graduate students. We have all of our assistant teachers. We always have at least two, perhaps three teachers with us in each class. Uh, so we serve typically about six, uh, at least six graduate students in, as our assistant teachers here each year. And our goal is to provide uh, professional development uh, for the teachers ongoing in a lab school. Uh, to do this, we embrace our philosophy, which being here at Teachers College, uh, really uh, is guided by John Dewey and his senses, uh, sense of child's wonder. And our goal is to really embrace the questions children ask and really make those our starting points. But that also includes the questions our educators ask as well, because we are, that mission is always dual. We do this in, uh, we do this through a variety of tenets that kind of guide our work from respect uh, for children, respect for educators as well. Early love of learning, which is our students very quickly learn that their teachers are also students, and that their teachers have teachers, and their teachers have teachers, and there's a cycle of learning that's never ending. Uh, and then certainly intentionality. Uh, as being a lab school, Elizabeth, Marisa, and myself are continually asking ourselves, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? How is it most supportive of, of the children? How is this most supportive of our teachers? And what are we making possible in our classroom for everyone within the community? Our curriculum is what enables us to do this, to do this work. We choose curriculum that is, or interdisciplinary units of study that will give us an opportunity for breadth and depth within our studies. We typically study about four to six uh, different units of, uh, uh, units of uh, study throughout the school year, depending on just the calendar and depending on the group of children, the teachers, and the topics we choose. Within this, we're looking for a balance of teacher-directed activities and then child-responsive, child-selected opportunities. Uh, throughout all of this, John Dewey uh, resides in giving us that question of how do we make learning viable? How do we make learning real for our children? And so in choosing our topics, things such as an anthropological study, a scientific study, an aesthetic study, author studies, genre studies, we're looking for study topics that will give us opportunities for breadth and depth, but then also multiple avenues of inquiry and exploration. So the morning class always starts their year the same way, um, uh, building community. For some of the children, it's their first uh, school experience, and for others, they've been in school elsewhere, but it's an introduction to what is school at Hollingworth. Um, so we do a lot of projects and things to build that community. One of them is um, asking the children to bring in their uh, six or seven of their favorite things and sharing them with their um, peers, and very quickly we start to make connections that way. This year, I think 15 of our children brought in a book, so we could tell from the beginning that literacy was a shared interest among all of us. Um, and then we go on to do other projects. Um, we have this beautiful stained glass window of our dragon feet, but we also, on the back green counter, have a little stuffed heath that we send home with each child, and they get to have heath for a week and um, do their normal routines with their family. And so we learn a lot about the children and their family and how they spend time together through that project. And you can look at the books back there to get a little more 
about that, but then of course we read a lot of literature. We do um, some assignments that we'll be talking about later um, about different things that we do at school and um, laying down a foundation for the year. And even though we begin the year with that and we call it our prelude study, it really <coughs> is ongoing through the rest of the year. Um, and that's all for this year. With the afternoon class of the 18 children that are four going on five, probably 15 to 16 of them were here with Maurice's class. So they're already a community. We're welcoming in a few new children. But for this class, what is primarily of importance is the fact that due to life in New York City, although they are just coming together as four-year-olds, they are beginning to have to think about kindergarten. Families have to go on visits. They're looking at schools. Children are being um, invited to play dates. And so we want to be very much in the now and the presence and welcoming the children as afternoon class, but we need to be supporting this idea that they're coming and sort of they're already thinking about leaving, and that's, that's, that's challenging. And so we have decided to support the metaphor of journey um, and life cycles, and that all of us are on a journey, and we come and we go around and we come back again. And so we look at the idea of migration as a unit of study, thinking about the monarch butterflies, who are very much present in New York City in September, making their journey southward, and also um, an, an item that we can literally bring into the classroom and study. We, we get in the caterpillars and um, the, the milkweed, which sometimes brings with it eggs that we don't realize, and so we, we have, we, we had one caterpillar that journeyed from this table all the way into the library to make his chrysalis and survived, which was a testament to community in the morning class as well. Um, we've also looked at humpback whale migration, very different, still tangible. The, the whales are in and around the New York City Harbor area. We don't have one in the classroom, but we found ways to bring aspects of, of the humpback whale in with us um, with the idea that, that the children are here in their present, but that there is something very exciting to look forward to. And leaving Hollingworth does not mean not coming back. That that is always an opportunity. From there, we'll often engage in full school, full school uh, units of study. For example, it might be something like an anthropological study. The photos from here is from our study of the Lenape, who are Manhattan's first inhabitants. Within any anthropological study, we within most studies, we'll begin with a game called Beat the Clock, which is a, a game for, with letters and numbers, in which we focus on trying to spell a word that's going to be central to our study. For an anthropological study such as the Lenape, or the people of the Pacific Northwest Coast, which we have artifacts over in our art area, uh, or say uh, the, the Inuit, which we have on a display at our round table over there, we need to consider the ethical, ethical aspects of what does it mean to study a group of people who were living in New York, have been displaced and are now living elsewhere, or a group of people who are currently still living, still living elsewhere. What do we need to engage in as educators first to make sure respect is central to that study? Another study that we did a few years ago was a study of national parks. And in this study, we certainly anticipated that there would be a scientific layer. We anticipated studying the flora and the fauna with the children. We also anticipated an aesthetic layer to our national study, to our, to our national park study, recognizing that Aaron Copeland and, and Ansel Adams had been deeply influenced by the nation's parks and made that uh, a spark for their own artistic endeavors. Uh, in any study, we place a lot of trust in our children. And as educators, we create foundational aspects, elements to share as a community. But then the actual inquiry really begins when we listen to the children and we really just go. So for the National Park study, um, we began in the morning class with those foundational pieces we talked a lot about the different habitats and um, climates in the national parks across the United States. 
um, we talked, like Heather said, a lot about the flora and the fauna, and came to realize that the morning class was interested in one kind of fauna, the snakes, and that's what they wanted to study. They wanted to look at the national parks through the lens of snakes, much to my chagrin, but I went with it, I trusted them. He was just and, great. Uh, you know, so they're asking questions about, um, you know, do snakes live in all of the parks? They don't. You can actually go to the website of every park and see if there's snakes, and if there are, what kinds live in a park. So we found that the desert parks um, house more snakes than others, but they're also found in the swamps, too. So the Everglades have some. Um, and then they wanted to know what they ate, how they moved, and we just followed their interests and helped them explore it in a way that was meaningful for them, even though it was not our plan. But it, it was, everybody enjoyed themselves in the end. So. In the uh, child responsive curriculum, oftentimes the teachers are starting with ideas. Where do we think perhaps this unit of study will go? And then the responsive part, as Marisa just shared, is the reality of where, where the children's passions need to be. With afternoon class, we started this study really wanting to help the children understand concepts of nationality and patriotism, because that was the spirit that drove the creation of the national parks. And so we spent a lot of time really trying to grapple with, with these very big ideas, you know, What's the name of our nation? New York. <laughs> Not to mention the complications of you live in a city named New York, but your state is named New York. Um, so we spent a lot of time just looking at, you know, we're in Manhattan. Manhattan is one of five boroughs in a city called New York. And the city of New York is one of very, you know, many cities in the state of New York. In the state of New York, you know, and so we had out our, our United States puzzles, we had out materials the children could build with that were in the colors red, white, and blue, setting um, a, a provocation. Why do you think we only had the red, white, and blue materials? That all the other of the matching materials had been sorted away and put in the closet. Um, we looked at song and story that really represented individual states as well as um, our nation. This land is your land, America the beautiful. Um, Country Roads Take Me Home was a, was a favorite and sung with gusto and passion uh, by all of the children. And, and then interesting, interestingly, from there, as we started to think about where, now that we were in the parks, what were we going to explore, the children took the idea of the park ranger and let us know that that was their snake passion. They wanted to know all about the park rangers. And, and how fascinating that the park rangers really served multiple uh, roles. They were, they were advocates of the park. They were protectors of the park. They are educators. Um, they sometimes are doctors for the park. Lots of, of different responsibilities. And we looked um, quite in depth at, at the many roles. And as you can see, they were quite happy to take on the roles of, of park rangers in their pretend play. The, within any unit of study, we firmly believe that a study should always end with more questions than with, than with answers. And so it's very typical that we'll conclude a study and still have many wonderings remaining. And that, for us, emphasizes the journey of education is ongoing. And just because we pause a study here in the classroom, it can continue and be a lifelong study for our children as well as our teachers. But to do the studies like this, we first need to consider our conceptions of young children with educators uh, as part of our professional development with the teachers here. Uh, we recognize that all children have passions, all children have potentials, and all children have areas in need of growth. And our job is to support that, their children's holistic growth. Uh, Howard Gardner really frames how we think about children come to know, and his work really asks us the question, how do children come to know? How do they express their knowledge and in inquiries? It also encourages us to encourage metacognitive thought in the children. How do you know what you know? As Elizabeth said, we live in the country of New York. How do we know this? Let's, let's unpack this. Let's work from the children. 
Lev Vygotsky also encourages us to work from the children in scaffolding our explorations with them. Vygotsky really asks us as educators to, the question, how do we provide each child in the classroom comfort yet challenge or challenge with or, cha or comfortable challenge within the classroom? All of this gives you kind of a foundational uh, overview of Hollingworth. And what we thought is just to give you a little slice of a day in the life of Hollingworth. Our day sounds like this. Hello, Hello meeting, choice, choice and snack time, play time, then farewell. We sing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and we write our own songs. <laughs> Not all of them, but we write a lot. <laughs> So our day begins with um, hello, which is really the transitional time where um, children are saying goodbye to their loved ones. So we as teachers are creating invitations to play and engage in the classroom. So we'll have our table set up maybe like this and also the art area or the green rug, um, really um, piquing the children's interest, um, catching their eye, um, creating wondrous and exciting things for them to come into so that it's a little bit easier to say goodbye to mom or dad in the, um, as they come in. Um, and then, so this is the setup, and then you'll see on the next slide, here are the children engaging with those invitations to play. Because if they have something exciting to come into, it's a lot easier to say goodbye to mom and dad. In the afternoon class, the children have a slightly longer day, and so our afternoon song is a little bit uh, different, but after hello time, our four-year-old children will eat lunch. They have a, a greeting time where we briefly recognize who's here before we get to our meeting, which comes a little bit later in the day. And for both classes, meeting time is, is our opportunity to sit down with the children as a group as a whole and get into the, the content of our study through the songs um, that we sometimes make to support snakes in the national parks. <laughs> Haven't found one on uh, iTunes yet. Yeah. Um, the materials we have to make too, you'll see them on that too. We uh, will engage in story that support our units of study, and it's also a time that we might do an activity as a whole to support the unit of study. It's a time that if there's a special activity that will be highlighted during choice time, assignments that Marisa alluded to and that we'll, we'll talk about in depth a little bit more, that, that's the time when we can really share that activity with the class as a whole. This is something to look forward to. And so, depending on what's happening, meeting can be very short, meeting can, can go a little bit longer, and it's something that we look to really scaffold the children as they're growing um, and working together as a community to build and build and build. Balance with meeting, which certainly is a very structured element of our day, is choice time, in which it's often very, very open, and this is a balance uh, within our day. The children are offered a variety of activities in our block area, our listening loft art area. We encourage really a child's whole self, uh, including sensory explorations, light explorations, pretend playing in the butterfly conservatory. Uh, also within our choice time, it's a time for assignments. And assignments is a term that we use for an activity that everyone must engage in. You have a choice within the assignments and a choice of when you do the assignments, but it's an activity that everyone will do. So in the morning class, we start the year off doing a lot of assignments, um, talking about putting down the foundation for the year. So we talk a lot about acceptable and unacceptable. There's a sign right behind Heather. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, but we don't introduce that until we start observing the unacceptable and the acceptable behavior happening in the classroom. Which this uh, year took a long time. Which this, I guess, it took forever this year. Usually <laughs> <laughs> it's like second week, boom. Exactly. We're ready. I was waiting to watch this this year. But, yeah. but again, in response to the group of children, right? So um, another assignment we're doing in the, in the beginning of the year is our voice chart. Instead of just using an indoor and outdoor voice at Collingworth, we feel that there's uh, a rainbow of voices that are acceptable in different places um, and different times, and it sounds like this. Purple, blue, green, purple, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, yellow, orange, red. I can speak a rainbow, I can speak a rainbow, I keep it in my head, I keep it in my head. So purple is the 
voice we'd use in the hallway, the TC shared corridors, you know, where everybody is having class or working. So that's like a whisper. Blue is to talk to your neighbor at the, at the green rug, somebody you're in close proximity to. If at the green rug, that's our green voice, you'd have to project a little bit for everybody to, to be able to hear you. And then yellow is playroom voice. So when we have a little bit more space and um, and a higher energy level. Hi higher energy level, and we're closed into our uh, dance studio room upstairs. Um, we can use the yellow voice, and then orange is outdoors, and red is an emergency voice that is reserved for some, if you need help right away. But um, these are uh, these are great um, assignments because then the children take them home, and the parents know what we've talked about that day, and can also help reinforce some of these concepts at home. Um, we also do a lot of self-portraits and family portraits at the beginning of the year. And then as we get into our studies, we do a lot more collaborative assignments and group work. Um, but assignments can look different um, throughout the year. So those are, that's just a taste of morning class assignments. In afternoon class, again, the children really have been a community. So we revisit some of those assignments that Marisa talked about, the voice chart, acceptable and unacceptable. Recognizing that we usually have one or two or three new students who we want to bring into the community and to become comfortable with the specific language of, of the Hollywood preschool setting. Uh, so we do those assignments, but we do them in a much quicker speed. And then we quickly step away from those assignments and get into the heart of our assorted studies. and. One of the things that we use assignments for is to create uh, conversation opportunities for the children. Because they eat lunch in the classroom, they have placemats. Helps to clean up the mess um, of spilled yogurts and applesauce, which becomes wallpaper paste um, pretty quickly. Instead of just making placemats for the children, we get the children involved in making placemats that are connected to their units of study. And so, for example, we just finished a unit of study looking at the works of Beatrix Potter and how she used her letters to inspire the stories that came about. And the children picked various characters <coughs> from her different stories and they picked from several different photographs of Beatrix's um, home area in the Lake District. And then they glued their characters onto the photograph. We laminated the placemats. And every day they sit down and tell stories about the characters on the placemats and look to see who has the same photograph but different characters, who has the same characters um, or different characters. And so this becomes an extension of our unit of study in a very informal setting. We do the same thing, making Play-Doh placemats to use, using making bookmarks when they want to hold their place in a book. Um, we also get into, as Marisa said, a, a wide range of other forms of assignments and you see down in the in the bottom center the children are up in the playroom and most of the children are wearing scarves that are clothes pinned onto the, the back of their shirts and two children are not and those two children are the humpback whales that are trying to work as a team to make a bubble net around the anchovies to better able to better able to be better able to feed and so they had to engage in teamwork. This was a game that a teacher adapted, and the children will forever ask, can we play whales and anchovies <laughs> when we go to the game? <laughs> so uh, a group assignment that was definitely a physical, small, small group activity. But not just are hoping for holistic experiences for our children, we're also looking for a holistic experience for our graduate students. We recognize being a lab school, our teachers are purposely set up for a cycle. of They're here for a few years and then they're, they're going to move on. Our hope is, is that while they're here and as they move on, they're going to carry a bit of Hollingworth with them. But we also hope that they're going to leave their own legacy here at Hollingworth uh, to remain. To do this logistically, we engage in a lot of professional development with our teachers. We begin in August with two weeks of professional development. Uh, some photos of just us engaging in Maurice's PD on an invitation to play. Looking at uh, the people of the Pacific Northwest Coast study are some of the materials that we lay out uh, to, provoke, to provoke discussion 
uh, with our educators before we begin a study. We'll also engage in uh, two days in January and then a week in June as formal times for professional development. But then it's also occurring all throughout the school year. Uh, Maurice and Elizabeth spend a lot of time each week in their team planning meetings. We collaborate quite a bit in our planning meetings, but then also with our weekly meetings as a faculty. But much of the professional development that's going on is within our daily life in the classroom. Recognizing that we're also here in New York City and up makes our position as a school rather unique. We also look to see what are the cultural events, what are the cultural opportunities available to us as educators. And so last June, as part of our reflective professional development, we visited MoMA's material lab uh, the, for all of our teachers to be able to give an, be given an opportunity to look to say, how are we encouraging children's sensory explorations in the classroom and what else might be possible? Also at MoMA, we were anticipating moving on to our study of Impressionism this past fall. So we made sure that we visited as a community to spark everyone's ideas uh, for the teachers who were returning of what might be possible in this unit. This past August, we also took advantage of visiting the New York Botanical Garden with our faculty, recognizing they had a stud, they had an exhibit of Monet's gardens uh, and the water lilies. And so we went as a community as another spark for our Impressionist study this past fall. Um, the professional development, development opportunities are also very responsive to the teachers. As Heather said, we have a lot of time throughout the year to do these um, different workshops and interactive um, professional development sessions. And so if the, if the teachers have a specific interest or passion, um, we will follow those. But also questions or um, concerns, we will also follow those. So in these pictures, this is um, one of our teachers who is in the music ed department, and he loved to bring his guitar in. And because we sing a lot anyways, he would just accompany us on the guitar. But also, he would compose songs with the children. And then um, another of our teachers is uh, very interested in visual arts, and so she's taken on a lot of courses here at TC, and she loves bringing in her ideas and sharing them with the children through different materials <coughs> and um, art projects that she sets up. This is, she, she did, uh, when we were studying uh, the Hudson River, the children did, decided to do um, paper mache, and we, they enjoyed it so much they did like like nine different animals. We were only going to do three, but they, kept, they wanted to keep going and going, and of course, Elaine was willing to go with them, so. Looking at the units of study that we engage with the children, there are many opportunities for our graduate student teachers to also be learning. Last year, at the end of the year, teachers who were leaving talked about having spent an entire year studying different aspects of New York City through authors and illustrators, through an exploration of Central Park, through architecture in New York City. They learned so much about the place that they had lived in all their life and were seeing it through a different lens. But even deeper than that is the opportunity for this to be a transformative experience. And about six years ago, we, we first engaged in a unit of study looking at the people of the Pacific Northwest Coast. And as Heather said, it was really important to talk about the history of this culture, but to really focus on the current vibrant aspects of this very strong culture. And we worked with the children to do a lot of different things, um, engaging in looking at community, where, how, how the homes were, what sort of transportation, what was the role of the totem poles? What aspect did that have to culture, to spirituality? One of the teachers in the classroom at that time only came in two days a week. She was not a part of the big planning things and, and everything that was happening. She graduated and left and three years ago came back to school for one of the many teachers, conference, teachers college conferences and came back to visit and said to me, did you see the opening ceremonies of the Vancouver Olympics? And she said, I cried. And I picked up the phone and I called Bridget, who was the, the assistant teacher at the time, 
and she was crying. And we both said at the same time, do you see the button blanket dancers? They're dancing in, in their traditional regalia. It's a very important part of the culture. And it's, it's a sort of more recent post-colonial um, contact aspect of the culture of these people. It had not been my intent, especially for our graduate teachers, to, to take that aspect away. It was the focus of introducing the children. But when she shared that story, that really hit me as all of the possibilities of our units of study and how they're actually changing the lives of our graduate students and, and what an important aspect that potentially offers. Recognizing that and with the hope that they, that working here and learning here, teaching here, living at Hollingworth will be a transformative experience for our educators, <coughs> we purposely engage in a professional development after the school year is over. For one week we meet once the children are gone and within this one week's time we have three facets that guide our work. One is reflecting back at our school here. Uh, another is closing our classroom. I mean, that's a physical just appreciating the now. But then balanced with this is an anticipation of what's to come. Looking at, for those who are returning, looking at the possibilities for next year or the possibilities for future careers in education, but it's all balanced within a, a self-reflexive lens. Uh, Maxine Green often says, I am not yet, and it's our hope that the educators here will carry that and live that with them. Um, we uh, would like to open up uh, the floor for questions. We also uh, recognize we have a lot of materials out that we've talked about that we do also want to give you time to look at. Questions? How are your students, what is the admission process for the students here? The, uh, the admissions process here is multifaceted. We engage the children in a variety of visits uh, from a one-on-one -on -one individual uh, session with Marisa in which they work on a variety of interesting engaging activities that gives us a, a sense of their holistic profile as learners but also gives us a sense since we do so many assignments how does how does the child respond to our approach of assignments uh, Elizabeth and I also engage the children in uh, a visit to the classroom with at least four other children and it's a mini version of our day we literally mini, mini. In, in about 50 55 minutes we get Almost everything, everything but in, snack. Yeah, everything but snack and playtime. <laughs> and that gives us a sense of how do the children respond to our balance of teacher structure and free play. It gives us a sense of transitions. Do the children enjoy song uh, since we do sing so much? And so we really, it also gives families an opportunity to get a sense of what is life like here at Hollingworth. Balance this with this, we ask all families to come for an open house, to come visit us, hear about the work, meet with our families, but then also uh, we have a rather long kind of family essay which is more of like 18 to 19 questions that are really looking at a child's whole pro profile. Of the family knows is, their, is uh, their child's first teacher and so share that, share that knowledge and those experiences with us. And then it really comes down to looking at a community. Uh, when we look at the children we say wow this is such a great match then what are the possibilities for the community balancing gender, uh, age, learning profiles, energy profiles? Are there any specialized students incorporated? The, in regards to special ed, for here, we, it's a balance of, and within our center, we do not have uh, an occupational therapist, we do not have a uh, physical therapist working with the center. That's not to say that students wouldn't receive that, that those services outside. Oftentimes for our program, uh, we find that children, it, it's not to say that something would not come up later on, uh, but oftentimes we're finding that it has not yet been identified. Uh, but we work with the families when, when we find that it does need to be. It's a, it's a major part of, of what we do uh, in terms of transitioning from morning class, really transitioning, recognizing that we're moving on to afternoon class. And Elizabeth, uh, as she spoke of earlier, recognizing right from the start with our prelude study of, of migration, school is a cycle. 
and recognizing that our children move on from here and go to public, to private, single-sex co-ed, traditional progressive schools. Out of the city? Yes, everywhere. Uh, in your philosophy, uh, it, um, it's about fun and not about achievement. Learning has to be joyous. Mm -hmm. Learning has to be joyous, and I think that that's something, inquiry has to be joyous, and I think that spark and that respect for young children's voices is the same. That's just one of the reasons why we really take, like, while we have our kind of foundational pieces and what we, we try to anticipate where we're going to go on a study, we're very open. I mean, I don't think I would have, in a million years, thought I would study about snakes for two months, but I did. Um, and the reason why it was because they were so joyful about this topic and they wanted to learn about it, and so I wanted to learn about it too. I think one of, one of my roles as a teacher is to support the creation of a foundation that learning is exciting. And in afternoon class, and morning class as well, in afternoon class we have a very, very short song that goes more information. And so, for example, we just started a unit of study of the Hudson River School of Painters, and we engaged the children in some very lengthy stories of the Hudson River, and then introduced through Beat the Clock the, the word, the, the phrase, Hudson River School of Painters. And the children looked at how many spaces, you know, this is a game of hangman where, where nobody ends up with the noose. They looked at all the letters and went, whoa, that's a challenge. And we talk about challenges. Are you ready for a challenge? And they're always ready for a challenge. And they actually only missed, they only had one incorrect letter. Somebody guessed an X, I think. Otherwise, because there were so many words, they, they, by the time they got all their vowels in, they had gotten everything. And they were like, oh my goodness, we are hot stuff. But right away, they wanted, they had questions. We had studied the Impressionists. <coughs> Did the Hudson River School of Painters use canvases? Did they use paints just like the Impressionists? Are we going to go out and be painting? They, they have this whole great big list. And as we started to explain very specifically about the school right away, they had more questions. And the children themselves said, well, we need more information. <laughs> and this is, I mean, this is creating this environment for an excitement, a, a thirst for learning. So you were waiting to... Is there, is there a financial cost to the uh, parents? And is that, uh, how do you uh, arrange that? How is that arranged? And also, what about the demographics? How do you tap the resources of the community? Do you go into the community and encourage the parents that's important for the uh, preschool education from, I believe, three to five years old, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, just before they transition into kindergarten. Mm -hmm. How do you go about doing that? The, we are an independent school here in New York City, so we are a private school. We do have some financial aid uh, available for families. Uh, in regards to what we do, uh, in terms of our community, we, our families actually come from a variety of places throughout New York. Uh, from this year, we have three uh, families from uh, Queens, uh, from uh, Manhattan, and from the Bronx. Uh, so while, we're, while many schools are community schools, we actually tend to have a lot of families who are commuting to Hollingworth because we are a very specific program that tends to look at, at early childhood through a slightly different lens. And that needs to be something families are really comfortable with. Within our work <coughs> at, at the school, in terms of outreach, we do work with universal pre-K in terms of professional development. But then we also work a lot of, we have a lot of visitors to the classroom. A lot of people come to kind of get a day in the life of Hollingworth. And so that becomes a crux of our work with teachers, uh, really supporting experiences for the teachers, uh, public school teachers, um, stay with us for a little while, uh, and then corresponding uh, very informally and formally uh, in the terms of those collaborations. Certainly, if we're studying the Hudson, the Hudson River, we're going to go out to Riverside Park almost every single day. And, um, we, we visit the, the Macy Art Gallery in the morning.
morning class only bi-weekly probably, so we're getting into to the TC community that way. Do you have a printed copy of your curriculum, or do you have to go online? <laughs> we actually, we, we have um, materials, admissions materials that really talk about our philosophy and our approach, but because I think no two studies would ever be the same, we, we often don't print out a guide in terms of here's how to do a study of the people of the Northwest Pacific Coast, uh, because we've done that a few different ways. We have a songbook. We do have a songbook. Yes, we do. <laughs> and the songbook Which is a lot of our curriculum. It is, because there's everything from, uh, you know, Hold On To The Railing, which is a song about safety in the hallways, going up and down the stairs, going up and down the stairs to songs that teach uh, uh, our numbers and letters, uh, to songs that really support a study. Yes? I have a question or um, looking for enlightenment. The age of laboratory schools was huge for a, a number of decades and then found its demise certainly in the 60s and then definitely into the 70s and gone. So very few laboratory schools, although they're certainly there. Mm -hmm. And as I look at studies about laboratory... I did my student teaching in one. Pardon me? I did my student teaching in one. At where? Uh, University of Connecticut. Okay. So that as I look, at, look for scholarship mm -hmm. on laboratory schools, I find that it's very limited. And so one of the things is laboratory schools, you know, you're, look, you're trying to use your laboratory of learning for a demonstration of best practices, right? As well as experimental and exploration of the curricula itself and whatever choices you might have and being prepared to be fluid, which you've addressed. Do, have you generated any scholarship from the observations and the experiences that have taken place here, either by yourselves in terms of authoring such scholarship or the graduate students who have come through here? I think most of our most of our scholarship is through presentations at uh, local, state, and national conferences and international conferences. I know Marisa, you attended the National Coalition <coughs> of uh, Campus Children's Centers, and you'll be surprised there are many, many laboratory schools <laughs> still functioning so, in many different. Um, <coughs> what do you find there are usually preschool and elementary laboratory schools? Preschool mostly, but. Um, some go on to elementary, but yeah, you should definitely go to uh, N4C website and if you're interested in laboratory school. Yeah, I just presented at that conference. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the laboratory school. Yeah, I'm just having another time in the Foundational skills needs to be a part of any preschool, and it's certainly a part of our preschool. Uh, what we tend to do is put the curriculum first and then go outward in terms of the foundational skills. So within, there's going to be, uh, within our centers, there's going to be cutting, pasting, writing uh, opportunities that are really looking at fine motor skills and development, early literacy development, but we're looking to uh, make it more interdisciplinary. So the focus becomes inquiry, uh, in regards to the study topic, but within that, we are embedding a lot of foundational skills for our students that are really vital. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Much more than natural. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Which is which is a, it's a challenge, and it, for us, it also means that we constantly need to look and consider what elements have been addressed within a unit of study, and which elements do we need to make sure we we keep a close eye on and support our children. But that's also why we have these larger, longer units of study, because that allows us opportunity to say, let's take an aesthetic unit of study like Monet's Garden at Giverny and explore the science of color mixing. Um, because Monet could not go to Michael's to pick up his tubes of, of oil paint. He needed to know, if I want this shade of green, how much yellow did I put in and how much blue did I put in? Um, and, and that would not be able to be explored in, a, in that way in a tighter, smaller unit of study. <laughs>
I think it happens a lot within our planning meetings mm -hmm. of really doing, I know Marisa and Elizabeth do a lot of brainstorming with the teachers, a lot of webbing of what are the possible connections, what are the planned possibilities, and really thinking carefully about mathematics, thinking about science, literacy, social studies. Oh, I was just going to say, you're right, there's not too much math with snakes, but uh, we do the Babel chart every Wednesday and also the transportation chart. And so during our meetings, and this is a really organic and natural way to compare numbers, to do addition problems, the, the kids will say, four people want plan, three people want plan B, that's seven. Um, so they're, they're making those connections for themselves and they're getting it in other ways, even if it's not set in a stone in our curriculum. Um, since you do follow the lead of the children and respect for um, children's learning, etc., could you talk a little bit about um, the assessment systems you use? I would imagine you must have some form of assessment that's ongoing. The, our assessment is very organic. Uh, our assignments are oftentimes, as much as they're a homeschool connection of here's what we're studying, here have the children carry it home to encourage conversations about school, it's also for us as educators definite forms of assessment uh, in that, in that tends to be very organic uh, in, in terms of a, a, any type of rubric. I'm sorry, did you remember? Well, I guess I'm thinking yeah. primarily of, it's sort of embedded in, in much of your instruction are some foundational skills. So you, if there's some things you are looking for mm -hmm. in terms of children's mm -hmm. fine motor development, and, being the expressive and, language, And when we have parent-teacher conferences twice a year, that is when we're we're pulling all of that information and gathering it all together and putting it into um, the conversations to share. You know, we notice that your child is still indecisive about which hand they prefer to use, to, or um, you know, we're we're working on getting the scissors. You know, <laughs> the best way to do the cutting. Um, you know. Um, you know, you're or thinking about things. You know, s some children are really not quite yet comfortable with where their body is in space, especially around other children. And have you thought about, um, you know, some s outside activities to support that through um, different classes that the, the child might take in, in to support what we're doing here in the classroom? Mm -hmm. Do you have so a, kind of a general question about preschool. Um, so when, so I'll be dating myself a bit. So when I went to, when I was at, at that age, almost nobody went to preschool. People started in kindergarten, and kindergarten was just fun mostly. And then when, with my daughter, we sent her to preschool as we did with, as all the other parents did. So my question is, um, so I'm not an educator. Um, have there been benefits shown to uh, regarding child development uh, through preschool over time? And are there some kids who are just not appropriate for preschool? As I thought, I don't think I would have been. <laughs> so just, just some general questions about it. I don't want to. I don't, I don't want you to lose your jobs or anything. I'm just asking. You <laughs> we haven't said anybody your remedial. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. I think certainly early childhood education to be vital in terms of student success in ongoing education. In regards to should every child uh, attend preschool, I think that that uh, speaks to the reason why there's so many different approaches to early childhood education. Uh, there's emergent programs, there's play-based programs. We tend to be very much of a hybrid mix of, of traditional to progressive. Uh, there's programs that are very traditional uh, and very skills oriented and children are going to respond to the program that really is a best <coughs> match for them and that becomes part of our admissions is really looking and saying would this be a best match for the children because there's there's going to be a program out there that would meet a child's needs it's just a matter of finding that match and a match for the parents <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, we're on to our final question I know because when I was a student um, here, we had introduced a, a, a gifted program with children who had scored very high in the top children in the country. They were committed, they had to speak at least six languages or something like that. 
but it was short lived. I don't know if it was restarted in the 80s, 90s, or now. The within early childhood uh, development of precocity or giftedness is, is quite a, a controversial topic. Uh, often, you, we take the standpoint that they're too young. They're still developing, and we firmly believe all children have passions, all children have potentials, and all children have areas in need of support. Uh, that being said, we recognize that children, this we're hoping for a really strong early childhood <coughs> start for their education, and then moving onward. Uh, our children attend a variety of schools, many do go on to attend uh, gifted and talented programs within the New York City public school system, and, and as Elizabeth said, and elsewhere. We want to thank you. We, we were told this is our final question. Thank you all. Thank you.